assignment. All right. Good morning, good morning. Let's join together. Praise the Lord in song. Praise him, praise him. Stand together and sing with me this morning. Excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He got rock of hope of eternal salvation. Excellent greatness, praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Amen. Amen. Just be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to see you all today. If you're new here, we just want to say. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist. Holly Springs, we're super glad that you joined us today for worship this morning. we got a few announcements for you guys today. Um, we had almost over 800 views on Facebook this past week, so we just want to welcome our Facebook folks this morning real quick. Super glad you guys are joining with us. If you would just hit that share button and get our services out there. Hey, um, this next coming, uh, well, excuse me, let's start with today. So this afternoon we have our wet and wacky end of se summer celebration for our kids. So that's going to begin at 4 p.m. We're going to have a water slide, water balloons, water guns. Um, your kids are super excited. I've heard I'm super excited. It's going to be a super fun afternoon of just uh, a lot of fun and uh, water. So it's going to be enjoyable. Um, next week, continuing the same water theme, our youth are going to have a pool party on August the 3rd on Saturday. We're going to be at the Stroops house over there. So I just asked that if you're students, if you have a student, uh, just invite them, please. We're going to have a good time. Simpson's going to cook us a lot of food, so I'm super excited for that. So just invite your students to come out to our pool party. And then we also have a revival beginning next Sunday. Okay, Sunday is our, the beginning of our revival services. It's going to continue it through Wednesday of next week. So we just ask that you would continue to be in prayer for revival. We ask that you would continue to just pray, pray, pray throughout this week leading into this weekend and then next week, and then that you would show up and that you would invite people to come to be a part of our revival services. We're looking forward to just a couple of good nights of worship, in our, uh, worshiping our Lord and Savior. Um, before we pray, Brother Joe asked me if we would just stand up and greet one another this morning. Let's just stand and, and welcome one another this morning. Hey, how are you? What's he doing now? Get back up there. Get him back up there. <laughs> August the 4th. Next weekend. Starts next next Sunday. You gotta be in your bulletin, man. You're too early. <laughs>
Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for another day, God, to just come into your house, Lord, to just worship you, God. We thank, we thank you for, Lord, for joy, Father, for laughter amongst one another, God, and just for, for a family, God, for, to just be joined together here, Father, united in you, Lord, but with people, God, who we can call our brothers and sisters in Christ, Father. We just ask that as we continue to worship you this morning, God, that you would just be exalted on high, Lord. We pray that you would continue to guide each and every one of us in our daily lives, Lord, that you would just give us opportunities to share your gospel with those around us, Father. We love you. We praise you, Lord. We just pray right now, God, that you would prepare our hearts for revival this next coming weekend, Father, and into next week, God. We just love you. We praise you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Join me in seeing trust try improve me. Is a set word. Stand with me a sec. Sorry. Back up. Okay. of our hearts to the Lord. Sing with me. See you. I want to see. 
Now for special music, everybody's going to sing it today. We're going to sing God Will Make a Way two times, and then once, just a cappella, the whole church. Sing with me all the way through, just a few times. <laughs> Not 
people said. Amen. Amen. Let's thank the Lord for our worship leader this morning. Thank the Lord for Caleb. Amen. You did a good job singing. You can go to work tomorrow school and tell everybody you sang the special at church yesterday and you won't be telling a complete lie, sort of one maybe. Amen. And it's good to be in God's house and uh, Bob and Suzanne, I talked to Bob the other day and he said, we're not going to be there Sunday. They uh, have a family get-together. But it was kind of agreed upon. He, uh, he doesn't have to tell me where he is anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, Bob, if you're watching, we always miss you guys. Pray you have a great day with your family. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Father, for this gathering today in your house Father, for those who are watching on Facebook, Lord, pray that you would speak to them just as if they are sitting in this building in this worship center with the rest of us. And God, may they feel that partnership today with all of us uh, who are followers of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as always, I pray if there's someone listening, either in this, present in this group or somewhere uh, listening on on the internet and Facebook, if they're lost, that today would be the day they'd come to salvation in Jesus Christ. Speak to our hearts, Father, just as Jesus took the fish and the loaves and, and broke them and fed the people. Father, may you take your word and give us those morsels today and that, Father God, will multiply and, and Lord, feed us and empower us, Lord, for... Uh, the week that is ahead, as we get ready for revival, Father God, may you prepare our hearts, we pray. And if that's your desire today, would you join with me and say, Amen. 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 Take your Bibles and open them to Matthew chapter 22. And also Matthew chapter 28. Again, one of those assignments. We're going to use a lot of scripture today. Uh, if somebody ever complained and said, you, you use a lot of scripture, would you, would you rather hear a pastor that doesn't use any <laughs> or very much? I've heard, of, I've heard those too, by the way. Uh, today we're concluding our revival prep sermon series based on this simple traffic light. Those of you who are getting the glare of this are ready for this series to be over, right? And we started with the red light, and we said, sometimes God, God's word says what? Stop. stop. God's word tells us to stop. Uh, we said the Bible has prohibitions. That's not always popular, is it? Sometimes the Bible says that things are wrong. Sometimes it says stop. Uh, remember, we talked about... <coughs> The lady caught in adultery that was brought to Jesus. And Jesus secured her safety that day by his exposing hypocrisy. And then he told her to go and sin no more. He said, stop. Stop to what? Stop to immorality. He said, stop to lying and deceitfulness. That's part of immorality. He says, stop to destroying the family. Satan is destroying our families. 
And he said, stop to defying the Lord. Remember, the psalmist said, against you, you only, Lord, have I sinned. All sin is directed toward God, it's disobedience to his command. So we started with the red light. Then we went out of order because we went to the yellow light. What does the yellow light tell us to do? Caution. Clear the intersection. To most of us, the yellow light means what? <laughs> I won't say who it was, but I had somebody, after I preached that sermon, they said, uh, your sermon hit home because my driver today st stopped before they went in the intersection when they saw the yellow light. And so I... Uh, and so that worked. Uh, we went out of order. The yellow light doesn't come after the red light. It comes after the green light, doesn't it? But we said, the Bible says, slow down in order to experience God. Remember, the psalmist said, be still and know that I'm God. And we always talk about that. Isn't it sad that we live in such a hurry? You know, I know, I know even retired people a lot of times Somebody said, I wish I'd have kept working because retirement's killing me uh, because you're that busy. And so we're used to being busy and we stay busy. And sometimes we miss out on a lot of things that God would have us to learn and know and understand. And the Bible also says slow down on your speech, uh, slow down on your anger. Remember James said, be quick to listen and slow to be angry and slow to speak. We said God gave us two ears, two eyes, two nostrils, <laughs> but one mouth, right? Uh, sometimes we say things that we don't need to say, but today we're going to end on that positive note. Green means what? Go. And uh, we love the green light. It tells us to go. Now, we're not going to contradict what we said in that first sermon, that sometimes the Bible says stop and there are prohibitions in the Bible. There are things that are right and things that are wrong. The world tells us today that there is no morality, no universal morality. You, you decide what's right and wrong for you and I'll decide what's right and wrong for me. It's one of the things that's happening in our society and in our country. Uh, the Bible says thou shalt not about some things. But we end today... On that wonderful note, the Bible also says, thou shalt. <laughs> and the Bible says, go, here are things that you are to do. There's no limit to them. Uh, there's no limit to the blessings that you're going to get from these positive affirmations. The word affirmation comes from a Latin root word, which means to steady or to strengthen a positive commander, affirmation helps us to fortify our resolve. Psychiatrists say that for an affirmation to be positive, it has to have three things. Number one, it has to be in the present. And when the Bible, every time the Bible tells us to go and to do something, it is beginning when, right now, and carrying on through eternity. And then they tell us that for an affirmation to be positive, it has to be personal. Sometimes people read the Bible, and especially one of the verses we're going to read this morning, and they think that's for somebody else. I think some, some people read the Bible and think they're eavesdropping on a conversation God is having with somebody else. But the Bible commands us to do things. The Bible has affirmations for you and for me. And then they, the psychiatrist, psychologists tell us that affirmation has to be present, personal, and positive. Uh, we live in a world, all the news is bad all the time. I, don't, I can't watch it, folks. I will go in sometime, and uh, Patty has the, uh, the TV on, and she'll be watching the news. And I say, Lord, this woman that thou gavest me, from back engines, and I'll say, just, let's just turn it off. I need good news, don't you? <laughs> I need something positive in a, in a world that's filled with such uh, negative uh, negativity. 
In Matthew chapter 22 and in Matthew 28, the Lord Jesus gives the green light for three actions that will bring a blessing to us and to the world. Look there in Matthew 22, uh, beginning in verse 35. Matthew 22, verse 35. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, Rabbi, Rabboni, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Do you see them? They ask the question, fold their arms and step back. It's never good to try to add tricks of the author of a book with a question about that book. He knows it better than anybody else, doesn't it? He wrote it. It's his word. In verse 37, Jesus replied, here's the greatest commandment in the law. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. I like it. They're like a uh, coat rack, <laughs> a peg that you walk in and you hang, you know, this, your, your backpack from school and then your coat and your umbrella and everything hangs on these two pegs, if you would, these two cornerstones. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. And Mark and Luke add the word strength. And uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then over in Matthew 28, that familiar passage that we know is the Great Commission. Matthew 28, verse 19 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So here are three concluding positive commandments as we get ready for revival. Jesus tells us to love the Lord, love one another, and love the lost. Jesus said we are to love the Lord. The Lord loves us. Isn't it good to know today that God loves you? <laughs> Are you glad of that? Amen. Isn't that a positive thing to think of today in a world that's filled with so much bad news to think God loves me so much he'd send his son to die on the cross for my worthless self? <laughs> I wasn't worthless to him, was I? Neither are you. That God loves us that much. And it's so wonderful to reciprocate that love. And to just tell God that we love him. Back over in Matthew chapter 22, there's a series of four questions that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians uh, and a scribe asked Jesus. And they're looking to trap him. They're hoping he's going to say something that they can use against him. And so they ask him these questions. And in verse 35, it says, an expert in the law asked Jesus the question. Folks, I've met a lot of these folks. Friends, I've met a lot of these folks. They're experts in the Bible, but they're not experts about the lordship of Jesus Christ. We had a fellow that lived in our town, in which we served in, in Tennessee for 15 years, and this man was, lived in this town. He was a cynic. He, was, he didn't believe. And he was the kind of person, he reminds me of one of these individuals. You know what he liked to do? He liked to debate Christian people. And he would open up his home. <laughs> and I had so many people say, uh, why don't you go over there and just, just take him down or, or debate him? And I, I wasn't about to do that. I witnessed to him, tell him God loves him. But so many, so many people think they know the word, but really they're missing out on the heart of what the word says. And this expert in the law came and he said, what is the greatest commandment in the law? What is the law? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those, that Pentateuch. But also you, for us, you might say the Old Testament. What is the greatest commandment in the Old Testament? What is the greatest commandment? And he tells, he responds to this fellow, doesn't he? 
Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, Jesus said that we are to agape the Lord our God. We all know that Greek word, don't we? It means to love, and it is what kind of love? It's the deepest love. It, it is a self-sacrificing love, isn't it? We are to love the Lord, and here's another word you'll pick up on. We are to love the Lord with all of our cardia. Cardia. Get the word cardiac from that. Heart. We're to love the Lord with all of our heart. Jesus said that we are to love the Lord with all of our suke. We get the word psychology from that. And it represents yourself, your, uh, you, who you are, your inmost being, your soul. I love the King James Version when it talks about when God created Adam. And it says that God breathed the breath of life into Adam and Adam became a living soul. It probably is best understood as a person, as a being, but um, man has something that no other animal has. We are our soul. Somebody was asking me earlier about cremation. Uh, you know, sometimes that, that question comes up. Uh, and I always share the same thing. That's up to you. That's up to your family. That's up to your loved ones. That doesn't mean you're a heathen or that you're not going to go to heaven. Because after we leave this body, it's going to deteriorate. Because it's not who we are. Uh, it's like we're looking out through a, uh, a pair of binoculars, which is our eyes. We're housed in this body. But this body is not who we are. Someday we're going to have a, a new body. And when we get to, you know, that time's going to come when there's going to be a, uh, a, the resurrection of the dead. But God is going to recreate those bodies. So you do whatever you feel like is best for you and your family. And there's, no, there's nothing uh, inherently wrong with that. Jesus said that <clears throat> we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all our, our soul, that which is us, that which lives forever. And he says, you are to love the Lord your God with all of you, your dianovia. It means mind or understanding. Uh, your purpose for living is to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. What a wonderful blessing it is when he says, go. Go love the Lord. There's no limit to it. And there's no limit to the blessings that you're going to get when you invite Jesus to come into your heart and your life and you experience that love and you return that love to him. How many of you just from time to time say, Lord, I love you. God, I love you. Thank you for loving me. <laughs> I surely do not deserve it. Thank you for loving me. Jesus said in Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind and love something or someone else in the same way at the same level. Paul had a lot of people that went with him when he went on missionary journeys. The Bible tells us that Luke, uh, the writer of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, he is a doctor. He's referred to as a physician. Dr. Luke went with Paul on the second and third missionary journey. And Paul also had a companion that went with him that helped him by the name of Demas. And Demas is mentioned three times in the New Testament. And at the close to the letter uh, of the church, I don't know that I got this. We, did I get Colossians 4.14? I may not have gotten that one. Yeah, our dear, there we go. Our, uh, she thinks clearly when I'm not. Our dear friend, Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. So everything's good here, right? At the end of the book of, or at the book of Philemon, do I have that book, that uh, verse from Philemon? I put Philemon 1, but there's really only one chapter, right? Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, as so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, 
my fellow workers, something happened. And it happens in a lot of people's lives. Something happened in the heart of, of Demas that changed him. And Paul mentions that change in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is at the very end uh, of his life and ministry. And notice what he says. Do your best to come to me quickly. He's writing to this young preacher, Timothy. Do your best to come to me quickly for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Have you noticed that desertion is key in the New Testament that represents that a person's heart's not right? Remember on the night that Jesus was betrayed, all the disciples said, they agreed, Peter spoke up, but they all agreed with Peter, said, we'll die with you. We won't, you know, we'll never deny you. And when the, the soldiers showed up, what happened? They fled. They deserted him. They abandoned him. When the going got tough, Demas got going, didn't he? Demas is an example of what Jesus uh, warned about in Matthew 6. You can't be devoted to the Lord and the ministry and to the world that is around us. Do you love the Lord? Do you, do you have that love for the Lord in your heart today? Do you just stop every once in a while and think, I am so blessed that God loves me. <laughs> I don't deserve it. You ever? I, I don't deserve that, but I'm so blessed because, because God loves me. There was uh, an article uh, in Stand Firm magazine back on July the 18th, and the author was reflecting on his dad on the 16th anniversary of his dad's home going. Uh, they, they found this prayer of his dad's, and the man put those words on a plaque and hung those in his office. I think I have that. This man's dad, this was his prayer every day. He would pray, renew my vision, strengthen my resolve to do your will, help me have a renewed zeal, and may my love for you supersede every love in my life. That's an awesome prayer. <laughs> I love my wife. In just a couple weeks from now, I figured out we would have been we will have been married forty one years. Forty one years. She always tells me to tell people she was eight years old when we got married. And, so. <laughs> and I know I can't love her any more than I love her, and I know she can't love me any more than she loves me. Uh, and as much as I know that, I know there's a place in her heart I can't fill. I can't fill it. She knows there's a place in my heart that she can't fill. And only God can fill that place. And when God fills that place and supersedes all the other relationships you have in life, then you're going to love your spouse the way you should love her. And your children and your grandchildren. Isn't it wonderful? Jesus gives this positive command. He says, love the Lord. And he said, love one another. Do you know, I'm, I think the church is one of the most self-destructive places on planet Earth. There's not a power outside the doors to any church that, that would threaten the existence of the church. You know, we have a goofy government at all levels now. And there's no doubt about it that if the government came after us, it would just make us stronger. We'd band together more. And Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. It's not what's out there. So oftentimes it's what? It's what's in here. Satan poses no threat outside the church, but boy, he gives a lot of threat to inside the church when people of God can't love each other. I have several verses. I don't know if I've got these in any kind of order. Jesus gave, somebody said, how many commandments are there? Were there 10? Well, there are 11 because remember in John 13, 34, 35, Jesus said, a new command I give you. 
And he authored the book so he can add another commandment if he chooses to. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And if it proves that our relationship with the Lord is right when we have love, what is the opposite of that? If people in churches... If they come ready for a fight when they come to a business meeting or any kind of meeting, it's proving there's something missing in that person's life or in the life of the church. John said in 1 John 4, 7 and 8, I know I've got these out of order. Look at that. She's good. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Whoever does not love doesn't know God because God is love. That's tough, isn't it? He goes on. Look at verses 16 and 17. And we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. 1 Peter 4.8 says, Above all, Love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. And then Colossians 3.14. And over all these virtues, over all these things, all of these positives, all of these prohibitions, all the commandments in the Bible, everything over all these virtues put on love which bind them all together in perfect unity. We need to love one another. If we can't love each other, we can't love the world, can we? If we can't love each other, we can't love the world. Uh, sometimes the most unloving place on planet Earth is in, is in a church, in a Baptist church. I had a friend of mine that was traveling, and he said, we visited a church, Southern Baptist Church, and he said it was a big church, and he said we got there, and he said we got there a few minutes ahead of time, and he said we went into the church, and he said there were some bulletins sitting there. We picked up a bulletin. No one handed us a bulletin. No one greeted us. And he said we went and sat down and kind of like, I, mean, I, said, I think they sat in the balcony, but he said a lot of people there, and we kind of sat like in the midst of them. And he said it was a good service. The preaching was good. The music was good. It was a big church, and so they had a lot to offer. And he said uh, we worshiped, and we sang an invitation. We left, and he came back, and he told me, he said, not one person in that church spoke to us. <coughs> From the time that he said, he said we were just going to kind of sit back and see. And I will say, well, now you should have spoke to somebody yourself, but I think he thought he was doing a scientific experiment to report back to me or something and so he got back home, and he said, not a single person. He said, some people acknowledged us. He said, they looked at us. They turned around and looked and whispered. They never spoke to us. And churches cannot figure out what's wrong. Why is the church not growing? Church is a place of love and joy. And I pray it's a place of enthusiasm. Listen. This afternoon, kids, at this, uh, when you get the water balloons, Sean Berry should be drenched from head to toe. When you get that water balloon, kids, you have one target in mind, okay? Oh, we love, we love kids. And we want them to be enthusiastic about coming to church because, and they will reflect that if you are. I read about a single mom. She took her little toddler to church every Sunday. It was a smaller church. They didn't, have, they didn't have a nursery. They didn't have children's church. And so she had to take her child into the worship service with her. And she said uh, that child was pretty well behaved. But he, she said every once in a while he liked to stand up in the pew. <laughs> and he, loved, he just was the most loving kid. And he had a vibrant smile. And he giggled. And said, she said he would stand up in the pew and look at the people behind him and smile, and it would, they would all smile back at him. 
and the mother kind of didn't realize it. And one day the child stood up and was in a particularly good mood, and she, he smiled and kind of giggled a little bit, and everybody behind him smiled back at him and kind of giggled a little bit, and the mother realized what was going on. She grabbed his arm and twisted his arm and forced him down in a pew. And that little boy put his head down and started sobbing a little bit. And the mother said, that's how you're supposed to act in church. And there are a lot of churches, that's how, you, that's how they tell you you're supposed to act. Real sad. There's nothing wrong with being, again, be still and know that I'm God. But if I want to clap in church, I'm going to clap. Somebody sent me a video. They're all on Facebook. You see them everywhere. Of these folks in a Pentecostal church dancing like, I've never seen anything like it. They were dancing like crazy. And I think gets, maybe that gets a little out of hand. But just be warned. That's all I can say. I don't know. That's it. I move on after that. How many times have I heard that? How many times have I heard that? What, attra what, did it, what attracted you to this church? And people say, it's love. And again, we went to a little church when we were in Fort Worth, and that little church was run down and nasty. Uh, it had a, a fellowship hall when you walked across the, the vinyl. The only thing holding you up from falling through that floor was that vinyl floor. And this was church in a area of town that was in transition should have died a decade ago but because of this loving pastor they were still there and they actually were baptizing some folks because all that it had to overcome it had the main ingredient it had love it was the most loving fellowship uh, that you can imagine Jesus gave those three positive commands he said love the Lord love one another and he said love the lost that third commandment's the hardest, isn't it? It's hard, it's hard to love people that hate you. It's easy to love each other. It's easy to love your, your spouse and your kids and your family, but it's hard to love people that hate you. And in that great commission in Matthew chapter 28, uh, Jesus said, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. The King James says, therefore go and teach the nations. The Greek word diskeblina is used for teach or make disciples. And it's the word for discipline. If you're in school, you know that it takes discipline to make good grades. You're in the military. They, they preach that discipline and teach you that. Uh, learning takes discipline. Teaching takes discipline. And, and literally it says that go and teach the nations. What are we teaching them? We're teaching them that God loves them. First step, he said, therefore, go and make disciples. What is the first step in making a disciple? You got to make a convert. You got to win them. And watch this, friends. That verse is for, not just for me, it's for who? It's for you. If you are not concerned with lost people around you enough to share with them, your heart is not right with God. I don't know how to witness. The blind man said, I can't answer any questions about him. All I know is I was blind, now I what? Now I can see. I can tell you my testimony. I can't answer any theological questions. But I can tell you the fact that I know God loves me and he saved me. Uh, to not share Jesus with a lost person uh, is a, a lack of love for that person. Everywhere that Paul went, he was rejected. Everywhere Paul went, can you imagine? If you were a missionary and you went to a town, what happened over here? Well, they kicked me out of town. What happened over here? Well, they threw me in jail. What happened over here? Well, I was beaten almost to death. What happened over here? They picked up stones and threw them at me and thought I was dead and left me for dead. And on and on and on. What happened over here? I got put in the dungeon in the jail and my legs put in the stocks. But he kept preaching, he kept sharing. Why? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14, I love this verse. This is the Phillips paraphrase. 
I think the King James says, the love of Christ constraineth me or compelleth me. The very spring of our actions is the love of Christ. How many of you have know what a spring-fed pond is? And it doesn't ever, you know, what happens to the level on those ponds most of the time? They stay what? It can be blazing hot outside and hadn't rained in six weeks, but the level what? It stays the same. It can rain and rain and rain and rain. A lot of times it stays the same. It's spring-fed. And I like that. The spring of our actions is God's love, not our love, because it runs out. <laughs> Listen, some dude just beat me up. I can't try to love him and witness to him, but God can through me. Uh, that great commission is not the great request. Oh, my goodness. We live in a sin-sick world. And loving the world, loving the lost, is very difficult. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a picture up here, but I'm only going to leave it up there for a moment, and then I'm going to uh, let Misty take it down. Do we have that picture? How many of you saw this the other night? At the opening to the Summer Olympic, Olympics in Paris, France, there were satanic symbols. But then here is the most blasphemous one that they showed. Can you put that up there again for just a minute? It is a mockery of the Lord's Supper by drag queens. These are dudes dressed up like women. And that famous painting where the Lord and the disciples are seated by the table, that's a parody of it. Blasphemy! And God's not going to put up with it. I don't believe very much longer. But how do you love them? And the Bible says go and make disciples. Go and teach the nations. Go and make converts. How do you do that? With God's love in us. That spring of life. I have a picture of very wealthy man, John D. Rockefeller, was one of the wealthiest Americans to ever uh, to, to live. Given, given really inflation, he would probably be the, mo the wealthiest American now, and maybe of all time. He had a lot of money. At the age of 38, John D. Rockefeller controlled 90% of the oil refined in this country. Standard Oil Company, uh, started by John D. Rockefeller. But he had all this money, and when he, was, when he turned 50, his health started to decline. You know, you decline after 50. After 50, it's what? <laughs> I, I don't want to think that because 50 is kind of getting in the way in the rearview mirror now. And when he was 53 years old, he started getting really sick. And all of his hair fell out. He had a team of doctor, doctors, and he could, this man that could eat anything he wanted to eat anytime he wanted to eat it, got to the point he could only eat soup and crackers. That's all he could keep down. And his team of doctors told him, said, Mr. Rockefeller, you're probably going to live for about another year at the rate you're going, and then you're going to die. Well, John D. Rockefeller thought, well, if I'm dying, I'm going to start giving my money away. <laughs> and he started uh, all of these endowments, and he became a great philanthropist, gave a great deal of his money away. The, one of the uh, agencies he gave money to or research grants that he gave uh, was the person that discovered penicillin. Who was that? Salt? Okay, Fleming. Now I'm confused. Now where was I? No. And so he did all of these things. He, he kept giving his money away. And guess what happened? He started feeling better. And at 53, the doctors told him that he was going to live for about a year. He lived until he was 93 years old. And he said this. Do I have that, doctor? He was expected to die at the age of 53, but he survived and reached 98. I said 93. Rockefeller learned gratitude and returned the 
great bulk of his money. This made him whole. It's one thing to be healed. It's another to become fit. He was a devout. Can I get an amen this morning? He was a devout Baptist who attended the Euclid Avenue Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio. Before he died, he wrote in his diary, God taught me that everything belongs to him, and I'm merely a conduit to carry out his will. My life has been one long, happy holiday since then, full of work and play. I let go of my worries along the road, and God was wonderful to me every day. Is he Lord of your life? I want you to take out, you should have a piece of paper here. Does everybody have a piece? Does anybody need a piece of paper? Raise your hand. Got some up in the, got some up in the attic up there and some down here if you need them in the balcony. Everybody needs to take a copy, a piece of this paper. Anybody need a pen? Somebody got their pens floating around? Everybody I know some of you are thinking, oh, great, not another business meeting. That's another, you know, we need a Baptist church, right, another business. The last Sunday before revival prep, if you were here Wednesday night, you already did this, and you can write the same thing down. I want you to take this piece of paper, and I want you to write down the name of at least one person that you're going to invite to come to revival next week. You're gonna, this person is going to be your project this week. I'm going to work to get this person here next Sunday morning or next Sunday night or the Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday night. One person can be a family member. It can be a neighbor. It can be a coworker. You may write down five or six or a dozen names on this. Say, I've got a bunch of folks I'm praying for. Do that and then fold it over. You don't have to show it to anybody. It can, be a, it can be a neighbor. It can be a family member. It can be somebody sitting on the row with you this morning on the same aisle with you. Uh, Angel's, Angel's going to get Jimmy here next week. That will be something, won't it? Yeah, it's here every week. Okay. Last service wasn't in here. Where did you see it? Okay, good. Write down the name of at least one person or family. It can be a family. Everybody. Make you think, well, who can I, who can I invite? Do you, are you, would you sit there and say, I don't know any lost people. I don't know a single one. I don't know a single uh, backslidden Baptist that I can call and say, hey, we miss you in church. Hey, where are you? You need to be in church. A Sunday school teacher, you could, you could check your Sunday school row and write down those names on this list and say, I want to pray for every one of these. Here's what I want you to do. Once you have that done, everybody, as you hold them up, hold those cards. You can fold it over, hold it up in the air. Some of you are just nonconformist Baptists, aren't you? I mean, you know, hey, hold them up in the air. Kind of push them a little toward me. Push them toward me. Now I'm going to pray for them. Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for every name written on these pieces of paper this day. Father, for families, Father, for loved ones, for uh, family members, uh, for uh, other relatives, Father, outside of the immediate family. Father, for friends, for co-workers, for people at school, uh, for the people next door. Father God, for each and every person, just names on a piece of paper, maybe to some of us, but somebody for whom Jesus died. God, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus for each person that uh, is mentioned in, on these pieces of paper that this week you'll work on their heart. And Father God, that you will work in the heart of this disciple who is here today, who is commanded to make disciples. Father God, this week to reach out to that person or those individuals and invite them to come, to witness to them, to share that wonderful blessing. Listen. You can love God, you can love his church, and together we can love the world and reach the world for him. Lord, I pray that you would just be glorified in everything that happens this week and then again during revival week. Oh, Father God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you take that with you. I'm going to stick mine in my pocket. We're going to sing an invitation hymn, my brother.
and it is have thine own, have thine own way, Lord. Yeah. Let's stand together this morning. God has spoken to you. You need to make a decision for him. You need to join this church. You need to be baptized. You know, baptism is obedience as well, isn't it? Yeah, Jesus said we're commanded to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. God has spoken to you. This is your opportunity. You come and say yes to him now as we sing. Thank you so much for being participants in worship. When you sing and when you pray and when you listen, you are participating in worship. Thank you so much. Don't forget, kids, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, come back and be a part of that. Uh, we're, ha we're having good numbers on Wednesday nights for our meal. We eat together down in the fellowship hall, and then we have our prayer meeting right there. Uh, and so that starts at 515, and the youth activity Saturday afternoon at uh, five o'clock at the Stroops Plantation. How's that? How many of you remember South Fork Ranch on Dallas? Remember that old TV show? This man has Dallas. So he has South Fork Ranch uh, out at his place. Uh, South Fork on uh, the old highway out there and be a part of it. And then next week, oh, we're so excited. I, uh, we think so much of Dr. Tommy Vincent. Uh, we've known him for a long time. And he's been a friend of this church, was here last year, did such a wonderful job. He's excited to come back. He was very excited when we invited him back uh, because he sees a lot of churches that are in turmoil and conflict. And he said, I'd love to come worship a bunch of folks who just love the Lord. <laughs> and that's a great compliment to you all. So pray it up. Next Sunday, we'll have a meal right after church. And then Monday through Wednesday, we'll have a meal before the service each night. You get off work and come straight to church. And the worship event begin will begin at 6.30. It's going to be a great week. You pray this week. Get ready for it. Brother Caleb, lead us. In step by step this morning. <laughs> Thank you. 